Inside my mind on eternity Some kind of ecstasy got a hold on me And I'm wondering where the lions are I'm wondering where the lions are Wondering where the lions are. Wondering where the lions are. You're doing great. Wondering where the lions are. Mm, wondering where the lions are. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Welcome everybody to the Where the Lions Are interviews tonight. Uh, as you can imagine, it's not easy at all to introduce our guest with 34 previous releases with 13 June Awards, uh, two Halls of Fame, the recent uh, induction in the Canadian Walk of Fame. Uh, it's really hard to introduce it, but really, let me just say that it's truly an honor to have you with, uh, with me here in Where the Lions Are. And uh, it's wonderful to have uh, <laughs> the, 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 the mind behind uh, wondering where the lions are here as a guest. So welcome, Bruce. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, good to be with you. Well, uh, somebody told me that you remember me and I I really sank because uh, in some way I hope that you had forgotten about that immature and somewhat naive fan who tortured you after every <laughs> concert. <laughs> and in your long experience, uh, I was wondering, do you think anything like that uh, has ever happened to you? I mean... Uh, being ashamed of an overly passionate part of ourselves that doesn't always remember to be discreet. Uh, yeah, I think, I think when we look back at our youth, we always find things like that. I mean, I can't imagine anyone not, you know. I mean, uh, it would have to be a, an incredibly egotistical person who, who is not, not embarrassed by some of the things that we did as young people. And you know, and continue to do really maybe with less frequency or a different in a different way. But, you know, I mean, nobody always gets things right. So, and, as, and I think, I mean, I remember, I'll tell you a story. When I, when I was going to music school in Boston, um, I, one of the places that I like to frequent, there was a folk club called the Unicorn around the corner from the school. It was very close to where I lived also. And, um, and I used to go there and hang out and, and I got to know the people there so I could kind of come and go and, and played at the open mics and that sort of thing. Uh, and um, so, you know, we could walk in and unless it was crowded or, you know, we could go in without paying and so on. And uh, they hired Sleepy John Estes to come and play. And, and Sleepy John Estes and the Tennessee Jug Busters, who were all quite old men by that time, and uh, and it was Sleepy John Estes and Yank Rachel on Sleepy John Estes singing and playing guitar, Yank Rachel on mandolin and Hammy Nixon on, on harmonica and jug. And all of them were great, uh, Yank Rachel in particular, but the uh, they needed an amplifier and I had an amp. So they and, and you know, they knew me. So they, they said, can we give an amp we can borrow for the week that they're here at this club? So I said, yeah, sure, great, you know, so fine. So I got to hang out with Sleepy John Estes all the time for a week. And he was, he had, he'd been blind about 10 years when they, his, the guys with him were happy to have somebody else volunteer to lead him around um, the, the city, you know, where as needed, which I did. But I also, on one of the nights, I remember sitting in the dressing room with them and, I, and we're all drinking whiskey. And, and I started singing blues at them. And and I just kept going. And they were, Hammy Nixon was like going, oh, you know. <laughs> and, and Yank Rachel was so sweet. He was like, he, he was so gracious about it. He said, no, man, he's singing the blues, you know. And he's smiling and being nice. And the others, the other guys were not that happy about me taking up their dressing room space with this, you know, my version of their music. And, and uh, so when I look back on something like that, it's incredibly embarrassing, but at the same time, it was a great experience and a learning experience, you know? So, so I, you know, I think that we all have stuff like that that we have, we can look at and, you know, I think, I mean, imagine, just imagine if I, if that were me in the dressing room there, I would have had a fit. Just get, the, get this out of here, <laughs> you know? <laughs> that would have been me. But Aunt Rachel was just like, so it was so cool. You know, and, and anyway, that that was that came to mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, so thanks for sharing that. And uh, ironically, I'm in Edinburgh, as I was saying, I'm in Edinburgh these days, right where we last met in 2018 during your uh, Bon On Bon tour. And mm -hmm. uh, a true Scotsman here uh, some days ago told me that uh, uh, the Bruce Coburn pronunciation of your name uh, is a Scottish. And uh, there is even a Coburn Street uh, in the city center of Edinburgh. Uh, so yeah. I was wondering, do you have uh, any connection with these uh, areas? Uh, well, historically, I, I mean, I don't personally, other than the business I've made, but uh, but the fa the Coburn family is originally from the area, <clears throat> excuse me, a little bit southeast of Edinburgh, uh, around a place called Jedburgh, which is is not far away. So it's kind of it's it's our part of Scotland. But um, but Sammy, you know, I I confess when I go there, I feel you know a certain kind of sense of root connection. When I hear bagpipes and and or, and or the, that drum, the bowron, uh, and and uh, the especially those instruments, but but the, the old Scottish music in general, uh, it just it I feel it moves in my blood. It it, it feels especially the drum and the bagpipes, and and uh, if you ever get to hear the combination, I mean, the, uh, pipe bands with snare drums and so on are. Are, can be exciting too in a different way, but it, that doesn't hit the that that root uh, sensor the way the way the the more the small scale stuff does. So I listen to Pibroch music, and I just I'm transported, and and it's and and you hear that drum, and you want to go to war. I mean, which is what it was about in the first, anyway. I mean, they, you know, it's it's um, the the. Uh, Coburn family motto, you know, is, is uh, well, it was it often translated as music excites. It's a Latin motto, it's akin to Cantu, but uh, music excites. And but the literal translation of it is crowing ignites, which is why I called my instrumental album Crowing Ignites. And uh, it's um, it, it, you can just picture some old, you know head of a clan head of I could the Coburns weren't really a clan it was a sept I guess but it but the the uh um you know the, somewhere back there was a head of the group and the and that head of the group picked that motto and I'm just thinking he wasn't talking about the dance floor he he's talking he's talking about going over the hill and slaughtering people you know and, and uh which was a lot of which was done for as you probably know, that for 300 years along the Scottish English border, it was basically Vietnam, and uh, yeah. so you know there was a lot of violence through that. But anyway, and uh, speaking of beginnings, speaking of origins, somewhat, you have an album coming out on uh, that celebrates 50 years since uh, your first uh, recording and collects this long period uh, of solo career, and. Uh, uh, making a record like this today in a world where uh, everybody uh, can endlessly create uh, their own playlist and uh, uh, when they are not created externally by an algorithm uh, or uh, anyway, when uh, where listening on streaming platform is somewhat predominant. I mean, uh, doing uh, uh, making a record like this today is something admirable from my point of view, uh, because you really inscribe uh, your uh, your own selection of songs and uh, so when did uh, when did the idea of uh, of this collection come about and have you had any dubs of this kind um it's i forget whose idea it was it might have been bernie finkelstein's idea or it might have been the record company's idea to do a greatest hits album and the timing of course is uh, as you were pointing out is is appropriate because it is the we're, we're doing the our second attempt at the 50th anniversary tour <laughs> which was supposed to happen in 2020 but didn't and and um but uh, the uh the, the, the putting the songs together was easy because because it it basically the emphasis is on the hits i mean hit you, you have to say it sort of euphemistically because it, it, many of these songs were not even close to hits but they were all 
songs that we wished were hits. <laughs> that okay. we, the, the songs that we said that, that were singles that we put out at radio over the years or, or, you know, steered people toward that way. I think we might've left off one or two that, that I just got forgotten about, but, but basically it's all of those songs for, for the 50 years. So, um, it's, uh, uh, it, there was no no need to agonize over uh, which songs would be on the album and which wouldn't. You know, it, it's okay. not intended to be my idea of a best of or Bernie's idea of a best of or somebody whoever's. You know, it's just uh, it's it's the singles, and as, as it happens, a lot of those songs are are ones that audiences have particularly related to anyway over the years. So it works out. Yeah, sure. So. Yeah, because I was wondering that it was uh, something really challenging to gather 50 years of uh, wonderful songs into into just 30 tracks. So that that explain a lot. And uh, I mean, uh, it it it's, it would have seemed to me like uh, uh, the the opposite, uh, something that the reverse process from uh, writing your memoir that. Uh, it occurred to me because uh, it like synthesized everything into just 30, 30 tracks. But yeah, well, I mean, in a way, it's there is a certain similarity and uh, coincidentally between the memoir and this, because although the selection of songs was different, it was um, because the, the, the focus of the memoir was sort of spiritual. Uh, then that, that simplified the song choice there because it's okay, these, these songs. The songs that that are kind of the framework of of the book of the story of me, <laughs> such as it is, uh, uh, the uh, are uh, were songs that kind of lean that way uh, in a in a spiritual direction, and and songs that have marked, uh, or that that songs about which I could could write, uh, in a in a meaningful way about uh, just aspects of my life and and my under, sort of unfolding understanding of life as it as it went um but but this, this of course you know yeah this is nothing like that in 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 terms of content but in terms of the simplicity of it, it sort of is yeah and it and it's a different kind of framework i mean because it's because the songs cover such a huge time span uh, uh it's um they do kind of tell the story in a way too I think so. Yeah, I think so. And um, well, and uh, talking about uh, stories, uh, uh, where the lions are, my radio shows uh, is uh, often for me an opportunity to travel between uh, a place. Ideally, travel obviously between a place and another. Well, discovering the backgrounds of uh, uh, behind a song, behind uh, uh, a songwriter, and. Uh, knowing that you have lived in so many cities, uh, for example, Ottawa, Toronto, Montreal, San Francisco, I would like to ask you, obviously, if you want to talk about it, uh, what memories do you have of the musical scenes of these cities in the periods uh, in which you lived there and uh, which ones were the most fertile when, uh, for you from a writing perspective? Well, the, the, uh... Yeah, they're they're all different. I mean, I've the, the scenes with which I was most closely connected, uh, related to a place like that, uh, were Boston and Ottawa uh, in the '60s. In the uh, because I lived in Boston for a couple of years, going to music school, and I I spent a lot of time listening to music there, and playing music with people. Um, so that. Uh, that was a period of discovery, perhaps the, the, the strongest, well, that was kind of the beginning. I was freshly out of high school and I, and, and I had been around the folk scene a bit before that in Ottawa, but, uh, but really being in Boston, I just met a lot of people who could teach me things and heard a lot of people play and, and, um, and got to watch what they did and so on. Um, it, when I went back to Ottawa after I dropped out of music school, um, then then I was part of the Ottawa music scene. We had a band, and th it was a very fertile uh, scene musically, out of proportion to the size of the population. I think, which might be true in 
in, pl in places like that, government towns or, or towns with one industry like that. It, I, I mean, there was no, you know, the government was the main business of the city of Ottawa, especially back then, and as it still is. But but uh, so it's a monoculture, and you know, but and and essentially a middle class monoculture. So you had a lot of people um, interested in leisure things like music, uh, but um, and that in terms of writing, I date my sort of the beginnings of my songwriting to that time, uh, I think I wrote the first song I wrote was in Boston, but, and I, and I had written a couple there, but by the, when I went back to Ottawa, I was like, okay, now I'm a songwriter and this is what I'm doing. And I, for that second half of the sixties, I was writing songs for the different bands that I was in. But by the end of the decade, I had, and you, I, you've heard or read this story before, I'm sure, but the, just the, the body of work that I had included a number of songs that I thought were good and I liked them better when I sang them by myself than I did with any of the bands that I played them with and and so I went solo and um then you know a year after that basically got to make the, my first album so uh, the songs on the first two albums basically reflect uh at least half of those songs were written uh, well, all of the first album was written in the '60s, and and um, and um, half the second album too. But um, after that, when I was once I was sort of touring as myself, and and uh, I, I sort of wasn't really part of a scene anymore in Toronto, and to some extent, uh, Murray McLaughlin introduced me to the, the Toronto music scene early on, and. Um, that also was very fertile. There was a lot of people playing good music around Toronto, and the, it was the, the home of the Mariposa Pope Festival, which was the first time I got on a big stage uh, solo and played for a large audience. And it wasn't very long before I started traveling a lot. Like the first time I traveled west was 1970. And so my wife, Kitty, my then wife, Kitty, and I just traveled all the time all the time we could as much of the year as we could without freezing and and uh so we'd winter in toronto or montreal or toronto or ottawa basically and then and then uh um you know travel the rest of the time but it, it, once we had a child then that changed but but then you know so i, I don't know i lived in toronto for after that marriage ended, I, I I lived in Toronto from basically 1980 to 2000, uh, and I it was certainly felt like part of the Toronto scene then. But it wasn't so much musical interaction; it was more social and and creative in the sense of, of ideas flowing around con through conversation and and uh, so on, and and being aware of what other people were up to. But um, that I mean, that was the era of you know. That was my rock and roll era, I guess, you know, in a way. And and uh, yeah, I'd gotten, I'd started that heading in that direction at, toward the end of the 70s. But, um, you know, once you got a drummer in the band, then you better have an electric guitar, too. And, and <laughs> so and so it went, and the things built up and built up. And... The billion facets of freedom turning in the Bloody nose and burning eyes Raised in half the sky I've been in trouble, man, okay I've been through the ringer, man, okay The walls are falling, man, okay under the mercy and okay. At the end of the 80s, I moved out of Toronto to a far horse farm west of the city, and I lived there for seven years. And um, that, uh, so I was I was technically in the Toronto area, but I, you know, it was more about the business and most of my social 
life was around horse shows <laughs> and that sort of thing. And, and, uh, um, and the, the gun club, because I, I got into competitive shooting around well, at the end of the 80s also. And, and I spent a lot of time with that, you know, and, and through the 90s, basically. Uh, then, then I, you know, in, in, uh, when it got to be 2000 and I was in Toronto and I realized I'd been in Toronto for 20 years, it seemed like long enough. I mean, that's, that's longer than I lived in Ottawa growing up. And so, okay, I'm out of here. And, and my, my daughter had moved to Montreal and, um, I was, uh, it, it just made sense. Um, I had a, a, a new girlfriend then who lived in Vermont. So it was Montreal was a lot closer to, uh, to her. So I moved there and I lived there for four years and then I bought a house, uh, in Ontario between halfway between Toronto and Montreal, more or less. And, and I still have that house, but now I live in San Francisco because my now <laughs> wife, uh, was living here when we first started going out. And then, then when, you know, various things happened in, in between, but she ended up getting a job here. Uh, and that, that's why we're here. And now we, it's an, I have a family life here. I have a young daughter and a, you know, a wife who has a good job with, that comes with a health plan. And in America, that's a very necessary thing. It's, there isn't any, <laughs> there's no social, um, there, there's no government health care, you know, so oh, yeah. in, in case, yeah. not really. Not, I mean, in Canada, there is a, a good system, actually, or it used to be good. I don't know if it still is. But, um, but in the states, there's nothing else. So, you know, you got to have healthcare, and and most of the musicians that I know, that unless they're very successful, they don't. I mean, they have the bare or the bare, um, and so if they get sick, there there's major problems. But but um, you know, I'm my wife has a good health plan because she works for the government, and it comes with a good health plan. When you work for them, you get the health. The, the <laughs> You, know, so. you got protection yeah yeah so thank you for this long for sharing with us this long journey of uh, of your life <laughs> yeah really. so it doesn't it didn't really answer your question about music scenes but it but but this yeah. i mean san francisco used to be a, a hotbed of all kinds of creativity but it isn't so much anymore it's really tech mm -hmm. world now and it's it's a lot like ottawa growing up it's a, it's that monoculture with you know that's except that it's not government it's tech that you know and so yeah, there's still music here um the, there's there's good jazz around and i don't know too much hell i mean i don't get out much because you know, i've partly because of covid of, uh, in the last couple of years but but also because of uh, just having a, a young child and uh, who has, has school to get to in the morning and my wife gets to has to get to work in the morning so we don't go out at night so i don't really know much about the scene here in a way in a recent interview on uh, cbc you were talking about uh, the 70s and in particular about the dichotomy between uh, uh, city and country in terms of uh, isolation and quoting your words the need to know your neighbor and uh, so if you'd like to talk about that, I'd be curious to know something about the very first uh, month in Toronto. So the, I mean, the difficulties, the doubts maybe of, uh, of that kind of a decision. Well, you know, I mean, it, it, the city wasn't, the concept of the city wasn't new. I grew up in the city, I mean, in Ottawa, a small city, but, but I, I had always loved nature and uh, I'm going to Toronto from Ottawa was, Toronto was, was not the city that it is now, 50 years ago or, or more. I mean, it was a, a, it was a much colder place, uh, culturally, much more uniformly Anglo-Saxon. Um, the, the, the neighborhood that I first lived in when I went there, uh, and I went there to join a band at the invitation of, of the guy that was putting the band together. And... Um, I got a room in the apartment of a friend uh, and it, the place was saturated with cockroaches and, um, and in a neighborhood that was all <clears throat> Eastern European immigrants who you, so you really didn't even hear English in the street. It was just uh, Ukrainian and Polish. And, 
um, every I'd walk out the door in the morning and across the street was a butcher shop and, the, and the, there was always a pit, severed pig's head in the window of the butcher shop. And it was like, yeah, welcome to Toronto. <laughs> well, <laughs> have, a, have a nice day. And, and it was really lonely. I mean, the, the first that year, I, I was friendly with the people in, that I was in the band with, but not really friends. Uh, we didn't have all that much in common other than the music. And there were a few people I knew from the folk scene that I'd known who came through Ottawa and I got to know them. And I would go to their house. Brent Titcomb was a singer-songwriter who, who I knew. And, and I, I ended up gravitating to his house. And his wife was very tolerant of, of me who sit there and somebody would light up a joint and then I would go catatonic Im immediately. Like it's, it's, it's always had a bad effect on me that way. I, I, after a while, I just stopped smoking that stuff altogether because it, it, I, I would just go inward and, you know, goodbye. I, you know, <laughs> see you the, the next time. But, it, but, uh, um, so that, you know, and I would sit there once in a while, I'd play some songs and somebody, we, we, or we'd play together and that was all right. But but uh, I didn't have much social life other than that. And, um, you know, walking around Yorkville, the, the, the hippie area of, that was equi the Toronto equivalent of Haight-Ashbury uh, was interesting and amusing and, you know, that was a place to go. But, uh, but mostly what I remember about Toronto in that era was just loneliness and, and a lot of emphasis on music. The band practiced a lot. We practiced every day uh, for not for hours uh, because we could and because we didn't have anything else to do. <laughs> you know, and and, and um, eventually we got gigs, and but we only got you know maybe half a dozen gigs in in them. I would say that band was together from August of '67 or September maybe to. Uh, to the spring of 68 and and in that time we probably had half a dozen actual gigs they were good ones but uh or at least they were big ones we, we got to open for Jimi hendrix and Jimi creep hendrix. And, and and wilson pickett and you know some some interesting people but you know it, it was uh it was it was a fertile time creatively but but uh, a hard time in every other way but uh, but it, it it got Toronto improved radically at the end of the well at the end of the seventies more or less, and my my sense of it is that there was a, a generation of Italian immigrants who had come to Toronto in earlier on in the, in the forties fifties I guess primarily the fifties they had kids and the kids grew up and the kids grew up in Italian household but in a North American context. And it's like, no, we're not putting up with this uptight wasp crap. We're going to have a life in the street, and they got and they made it, it happen. And I, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't have proof of this, but it was my impression at the time, and 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 nothing's come along to change it. That that, you know, you, you suddenly had a a generation of young adults who were who wanted to be able to have a drink on the sidewalk at a cafe instead of have, having to be shut behind doors because of, in the Victorian English view, which is what Toronto was the, the inheritor of, um, drinking had to be done in private, you know, you couldn't have, so you could go to a, 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 a there were no, no such thing as a bar, it could be, it had to be called a hotel, and, and it had to have like rooms, who knows what those rooms were like, but you'd go, it, in the, on the men's side, if you were not with a woman, and if you're with a woman, you had to go on the ladies and escorts side. And, you know, this was the law. And the, and the, the windows had to be opaque so that people on the street, passersby, wouldn't see the awful people drinking inside. And, and you know, this is, so the, this, this younger generation grew up and it's like, no, we're, we're going to change this. And they did. And so now it, uh, Toronto started to just open up. It already had a lot of, a lot of money and it had a, a, a lot of business going on and that sort of thing. But then it, it started to have a culture too. And um, beyond just the, 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 the very specific kind of stuff around Yorkville or, or uh, 
you know, in, in with in certain other genres of music, it just it just it just became a much better city, and it's been a great city ever since. So you know, now now it's so so multicultural and so so diverse that uh, it's really you know it's a great global city. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I saw Toronto in 2016 and uh, it was really like that. I also want to ask you if you want to if you want to talk about it in today's world. Uh, well, you you have maybe you have already explained to us that maybe if I understand understood well uh, your words, uh, it's, it's not so easy to know your musical neighbor anymore or or at least uh, Uh, as you meant it uh, at the time, uh, it's not so possible now in the in the cities, at least uh, that you know most closely. I, I think that's true. I mean, it's certainly my experience here in San Francisco. We have neighbors, uh, some of whom I'm acquainted with, most of whom I, I just nod at and smile and say hello, you know, when I because we recognize each other, but we don't know each other. But it's it is a little neighborhood where I live. And, and so the shop owners and the restaurants and so on get to recognize you after a while. And, and it feels uh, very friendly in that sense. But, um, but yeah, in terms of people to play music with, um, there's a, they're around, but I don't, I'm just not that social, I guess, anyway, other people probably would have an easier time, but, um, but uh, it's, um, I think, I mean, if I, if, if I, if I think, where would I find the equivalent of what I used to know? Because you, the thing was when you were all, it, it wasn't just the time and place. It was also the, the, uh, the economic level that we were all operating at. And, and the fact that none of us had real, for want of a better word, careers as, as our, as recording artists, we were, we were full of intention and we shared all with that intention. Yeah. Uh, as we got uh, to sort of do it for longer and some of us got more successful at it, then there got to be a gap between those of us who were more successful and those who weren't. And, and that's, that neighborliness kind of disappeared. Uh, so if I go to a folk festival or something that it comes back because people, there's the opportunity sometimes if you often you're in too much of a hurry, but But sometimes there's the opportunity to, to, to jam with people or you end up in workshops with people and it feels a bit like that old thing that we used to cherish. But, uh, but um, aside from that, for me, I mean, when, where am I going to meet anybody? I mean, I, when I'm on tour, I'm moving too fast. I'm too busy. And, too, you know, and after shows, I'm too tired, and whatever. So I'm not going to be going out and hanging out Um, and you know, if I'm at home, then I'm, I'm living the rhythm of my home life and it doesn't offer the opportunities like that either. So it's not just about the place you're in. It's, and it's, it's also a function of, of those other things. I think if I were, if I were starting out now, uh, it would be easier to find people to play with than it, than I, it is for me personally. Um, maybe not as easy as it was when I started, but I, but it, you know, it's, it was all coffee houses and there was music everywhere and people playing guitar in the street or in the parks and, and, uh, you could go, I mean, in any town, pretty much, almost any town of, of significant size, there was lots of, there were lots of places to hear music. Um, but now, I mean, there's nothing. And, and if what there is, is is just bars with, with a noisy audience and you know yeah. a, a particular only only certain kinds of music can thrive in that atmosphere so you don't you, you don't get the quiet reflective stuff that that i was able to do um there's there's a there, i think there's an audience for it but there's no place for them to hear it except that exactly. uh, except when they stream it you know so exactly. yeah. yeah exactly it, it's a bit sad to hear that and to reflect upon that and But anyway, we will see what uh, the future brings to, to, to us. And uh, that's yeah. It. yeah, it's I think so. And, and I mean, it's the nature of the of the world now. And, and it's going to become more. I mean, if the world continues in the direction that 
that it would like to go in, it seems, uh, it's going to get more like that. And, and eventually, I, I heard William Gibson talking about this, the, the, the sort of sci-fi author, the guy who invented the term cyberspace. And um, the, uh, he was speculating that now the, for artists, we're going to, that basically the hundred years that we've had recording, <clears throat> excuse me, and and the and the the public dissemination of music through recording and broadcast, that hundred years is coming to an end, and the the uh, for musicians to survive now, you're going to need what used to be patronage from the aristocracy, yeah. but now you're going to get it from cor corporate uh, entities, and and you know to some extent I. That's going to be true, and it's. I mean, it's already true. It's been true for a while in terms of the the big tours with, you know, the stage littered with beer ads and and whatever else. Uh, um, that those are have always depended on sponsorship, uh, but that's going to it's going to be more like that. And um, you know, I don't know. I mean, I guess we should be glad that we've had the we had the window we had, and we could all learn what we learned from that. But um, but I, I think that there's, there, there are lots of people who want to play music. And if there are people playing it, they're going to find a way to get it heard one way or another. I, I, I think whether, whether you can make a living off that is a whole other question though. You know, yeah. that's, that, that may depend on, on forces that we would rather not be dealing with. Yeah, exactly. And, um, and speaking again of the 70s, uh, uh, night vision was a big change. Speaking of the music and uh, in terms of production of arrangement was a big change, but also in terms of songs in, from my perspective, for example, uh, uh, Blues Got the Word or uh, mm -hmm. the, the wonderful Mama Just Wants to Barlows uh, that is also appear, will appear also in the upcoming album. So uh, I want to ask you, how did you meet the blues in that period and, uh, and how Mama just wants to barrel out all night long. Uh, was uh, was born. The blues uh, was a big factor for me, a big musical influence. Like as soon as, soon as I discovered it, actually, as soon as I was introduced to that music, uh, uh, especially the acoustic country blues stuff, and uh, and so you know, like I, I learned to finger pick trying to emulate those old blues singers. Um, so it was always there, you know, in the, in the, and it, it when night, when, it, after we finished, um, whatever the album before night vision was, um, uh, not, I can't remember the third, the name of the third album. It doesn't matter. But, the, but that, when we finished that album, I, I felt like I, I'd, I'd written a lot about nature. At that point, I mean, I'd used nature imagery to express other things, other, I, to spiritual ideas, etc., and written kind of songs that had a had that feel to them, and a kind of nature feel. And um, I was getting reviews that would describe me as kind of a nature poet or as a back to the land guy, you know, like what, what sort of one of the one of those hippies moving north to live in a, a geodesic dome, you know, in the woods and 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 I, I, I it wasn't me it was <laughs> i i didn't like being typecast like that i didn't or being to being pigeonholed i it, i you know i've never liked that kind of categorization and i resented it and i thought i'm going to do something different this time out and it uh, that that it was just a it was just a change of mindset it wasn't a, it wasn't like i went to the city looking for song material particularly i just paid more attention to that, to the, to the imagery that was around me. And um, the song, the Mama Just Wants to Barrel us came from, uh, I don't remember exactly what, what gave me the first idea for it, that phrase. I mean, a barrel house, of course, was, was an informal bar, you know, in the South in the 20s or, and earlier. Um, but, uh, and, and so barrel housing was got to, by extension, could be a verb that meant to spend time in, 
in that atmosphere and just hang out partying basically right uh some people took it to have a sexual connotation and and, and that's okay too if that's what you want to do but but uh that um i was just thinking of the of the of kind of what we would call boogieing so the but i you know we were staying kitty and i were staying in this hotel called the uh it was the waldorf astoria which is a, a, a kind of important sounding name but it was a flea bag of a hotel and and uh it's long gone now there's no there, there there's no uh, hotel like that in Toronto at this point, but I mean, with that name, but the, uh, it was a hotbed of, um, of, of prostitution. And so, so there were women coming and going all the time and uh, the cab drivers would say, well, oh, yeah, he's going to, well, you're staying in that place. Oh yeah. You know, and, and <laughs> I think that atmosphere has something to do with thinking of the song. For sure, you know, but um, it was kind of amusing. I mean, nothing, of it, none of it was bothersome in any way. I mean, it was sort of sad. I don't, you don't like to see. I don't like to see women feeling like they have to make a living that way. But I also rec respect the fact that they're people with the, who, who've made choices. Sometimes the choices are forced on them, but sometimes not. And so you know, fine. If we, we can all be friendly and be nice to each other in the elevator which we were, Every, everything was fine that way. But uh, the, some of the guys that came and went were creepy, but the women weren't. But the, but uh, the um, anyway, that that's what I remember about the atmosphere that produced that song. Um, otherwise, yeah, it, it, it's really that, well, like I said, the whole album was kind of leaning more toward the urban experience can't use the, I can't call it an urban album now in the modern context because that means, uh, you know, I I'd have to be black and I'd have to be, you know, yeah. like make doing this. <laughs> so so uh, uh, you know it, it's, but in the for me at the time it it was a, a step into the urban atmosphere. It, it scared me when I did that. Actually, it scared me after the fact because the audiences really liked it. Uh, people responded very in a very lively manner to songs like Barrel House. And, uh, and that shook me because I was used to reverence. I was used to people sitting on this and being very respectful of the music and not reacting very much. And, and uh, it, when people started hooting and hollering, it's like, oh my God, what have I done? up the road on easy street watching everybody stand around and cheat man comes up and says and uh, so so I, I backed off from it I it's, and and we the next album was salt sun and time which is the absolute opposite extreme it's very mellow acoustic uh you know, album. There's 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 a little bit of urban imagery in that, but it's much more. It's it's much less than on Night Vision. After a while, it all kind of came back around, and the '80s, from the '80s onward, it was everything all mixed together. But but yeah. uh, uh, anyway, that was Barrel House. <laughs> Thanks for sharing. That is completely new to know, to know about the, the background of. Uh... Mama just wants a barrel house because uh, I couldn't find it on the on the book, on your memoir. So I was really yeah, curious I didn't really about the background of the songs. Yeah, it's I I I I tell a little bit of that in the liner notes of the of the great the greatest hits package, but uh, um, okay. But uh, it's it's short shorter version than what you got. <laughs> <laughs> Happy and honored. <laughs> and uh, talking about uh, uh, urban life. Uh, that this is a long question, but I, I kind of find uh, an interconnection between songs uh, of the upcoming album, because uh, thinking about the themes of uh, home and urban life, uh, I noticed that this connection between some of the tracks, for example, uh, 
uh, the only one dedicated to one city in particular is, is Tokyo uh, with that kind of sense of dislocation that you just you describe in uh, your book and, and then there is obviously pacing the cage with the uh, which describes a, a, a domestic environment and the sense of uh, suffocation that can arise from that and finally uh, and also there is stolen land which which has a, a broader sense of home and a kind of sense of home and of land taken taken away and finally if it uh, this were my my uh, radio episode of mine i would end this short journey with uh, with open with their song open because uh, mm. it's from a certain uh, point of view for me it, it kind of uh, uh, give the sense of movement from one of these songs to the other one and so I if you'd like I, I would be curious to also have your point of view or your perspective about these themes these connections I mean these the songs are triggered by uh, sometimes quite momentary feelings and moods um, but Tokyo the two songs that came out of that 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 trip that well, actually, we're, that started on a on a flight back from from Tokyo, were the song Tokyo and also Grim Travelers, uh, which uh, and Grim Travelers. I, I was sitting. The the the, the promoters at, the Japanese promoters had paid for first class tickets from from Canada to Japan, which was great, and uh, I much appreciated. But I'm sitting next to a guy, a Japanese guy, but he was the Japanese representative to the World Bank. And, uh, and he starts talking about stuff we're chatting and, you know, he's telling me um, about all these great plans for what essentially was globalization, but we didn't use that term yet. And, and, I, and I'm going, yeah, well, what about, you know, you're going to take all the work from here and move it over there, but what about the people that are going to be put out of work? Oh, we'll just move the people. I mean, to him, it was the same as the commodities and the same as the, as the money, you know, that meant nothing more than that. And, and I was shocked by that. It added to the, this is not about Tokyo, but it, 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 it furthered the feeling as I was leaving, as I was dri being driven from my hotel to the airport uh, w when leaving Tokyo, we drove by an accident scene. And it was not, uh, I mean, it had to have been pretty recent because the traffic was all stopped, but they had, they had a crane on the side of the road. The guard, it was elevated highway going two different directions with the river or a canal or something down in between. And the guard wheel on the opposite direction that I could see was broken. And there was a crane there that was trying to pull a car up from below. And somebody had gone over the gone, gone through the railing and down into the canal. They had to be dead. And it was, uh, it was very, it was shocking scene. Um, made particularly so because it, when you tour in a place, when I tour in a place like Japan, I, I can't, you can't speak the language, you can't even read, you know, because the alphabet is different and, or, and you can't, uh, you're totally dependent on the hospitality of the people you're among. And the Japanese people are very hospitable to foreigners, not necessarily to each other so much, but they're, they're very gracious hosts. And so, uh, you know, I, I was really open in terms of my feelings because I've been the, reci the recipient of this great hospitality and being well looked after and all this friendliness for a couple of weeks. And and then suddenly there's death right there. And so I'm on, on the plane. I had a long time to think about that. And the, the, the song started to take shape then. Crumbling 
So it wasn't just about the city itself, but but I, in a way that the, the contrast that, that of between those two elements, the shock, the friendliness and hospitality, and the shock factor of death, d did seem to me to say something about the nature of urban life. We, we because we don't. If you live in the country, if you live, if you're a farmer, you're used to death. Your animals are dying all the time, and you may you may well be killing them all the time. And it's a different kind of view of life and death. And, and although you, nobody wishes for human death, but but uh, in the city we're all sheltered from all that. And <clears throat> most of us in modern in the modern world don't even we don't even see our old relatives die. I mean, they don't live with us. They live in institutions. We might see them in their la in their last few days, but we're not looking after them while they die. And so that insulation just created this kind of um, this huge dichotomy. Pacing the cage, uh, your 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 take on it was correct, but it was also uh, this the suffocation was some, uh, to some extent self inflicted because you get stuck in, in a place in your own life, not just, it's not just the physical surroundings or the, the emotional dynamics with your, the people you're with, <clears throat> but, you know, just, and so it's really, it's a song about being stuck in, on, on every level, basically. <laughs> um, and that song, I was triggered by the, the, the opening lines. What the, I, I was driving out from Toronto back to the farm approached the driveway of the farm and and the, what the farm consisted of basically was a house by the roadside and then a, a huge the 40 acres or well I don't know how many hectares that is of of uh, grass with a few trees here and there and then on the opposite side of that uh, uh, an escarpment a kind of cliff face that that uh, was wooded so I look across at that, which is the view every time I drove in a driveway. But this, it was sunset, and the, and the clouds and the light had formed this image that suggested uh, an angel holding a sword, and it was red and so bloody. But um, it was beautiful. But it just got this, it just like, wow, this is, you know, an angel holding a bloody sword. And it's just, the song just grew from that. Sunset is an angel weeping Holding out a bloody sword No matter how I squint I cannot Make out what it's pointing toward Sometimes the cage and then um, what was the other one now uh, well it was stolen open. land actually a, a stolen land was well, stolen land was written for a very specific occasion we, we did a benefit for uh, the the Haida people the uh, indigenous people that live on some islands uh, off of the what, the north coast of British Columbia, well, on the west coast of Canada, and they were in a territorial dispute with the government and with uh, private logging interests, and blockading loggers. We the same things going on in BC and in a different part of BC now, uh, but it, but it was really about their use of their own land and their ability to control the use of their land, um, and it's one of the few instances where I've seen, witnessed something like that that was successful. But before it was successful, it resulted in a whole lot of old people getting thrown in jail for, for protesting or for, for blocking roads and so on. So we were asked to, 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 if we could do something to help raise legal fees. And I was going to do a show in Vancouver anyway. And so we, we made that show into a benefit for the, the Haida. 
but I realized I, I didn't really have a song. I had Red Brother, Red Sister was sort of talked about native stuff a little bit, but, but only a little bit and not really in the right way that I wanted. So um, I, I thought I got together with Hugh Marsh and we wrote the, the song Stolen Land so that I would, would have something to sing that was appropriate. I, if I remember right, Hugh, Hugh was in the band at the time too. So, so it was basically my words and, and melody and his, his music uh, that made that song. And, and it worked out fine. I, <laughs> I didn't know how I was gonna do it solo um, because it was really, when you hear the record, I mean, it's really kind of R&B-ish. It's like it's, it really needs a band in that form. But uh, I went to a, an event that I got invited to uh, a major sort of tribal meeting uh, of the Haida. And, and um, yeah, of course, because I'd done this benefit for them I, the, and, and because of who I am, I, had, I was obliged to sing a song. And they had an old, there was an old man with a guitar, a really terrible guitar, who sang something in Haida. And it was, it was cool, but it wasn't, I couldn't have played his guitar. And I, so I, I, I thought, okay, well, I, I'll do, I'll sing Stolen Number, I'll just sing it with a drum. And so I sang it with the drum, with a, with a Haida drum, and, and it, it worked. And then I thought, oh, I could do this myself. With, with, and it, I started play, doing it with the boron, with the, the Celtic drum, where I could do a kind of bow diddly beat on the drum and, and sing the song. And then, uh, then that got one time I had to do it and I didn't have a drum, so I had to do it on the guitar and I did, figured out a way to do that, that sort of bow diddly beat on the guitar uh, with, in a finger picking way. And then with, with using repeating echo. Now I've got a different version of it. It's a bit more like the record. I, that I'll be doing in the, in the shows coming up. But, but that, anyway, the, the song came into being specifically for that event. But of course it has uh, a broad application because the same tensions between Aboriginal culture and, and settler culture uh, exists throughout the Americas. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, you can find people, people relate to that who pay attention to that, those issues uh, everywhere I go. From Tierra del Fuego to Ungava Bay, the history of betrayal continues to today. The spirit of almighty voice, the ghost of Hannah May, call like thunder from the mountains, you can hear them say it's a storm. Apartheid in Arizona, slaughter in Brazil. If bullets don't get good PR, there's other ways to kill. Kidnap all the children. Put them in a foreign system Bring them up in no man's land Where no one really wants them It's a stolen land a Stolen land And then open, open. I woke up one morning in Montreal and started writing stuff down, and that's basically what it what it was. I was this is when I left Toronto in 2000. I moved to Montreal and 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 uh, I was there for the for four years basically. And that uh, so some one it was a Sunday morning. I'm pretty sure because there were church bells. Uh, um, but it, but yeah, basically it's just my girlfriend was in Vermont. I was in Montreal. 
I was, I was looking at her picture and I mean, the song is basically quite literal, uh, but the feeling of the, the chorus of an open, I just, sometimes you face a day and it seems like everything is shut. And other times you feel it face a day and it seems like, you know, the, the, the doors are all open and the light is pouring in. And it, it was one of those. patience of uh, answering to all these songs and uh, well uh, as you as you saw uh, the some months ago I met uh, Colin Linden and uh, he told me that in the summer of 1991 he, he was coming home from Woodstock uh, he checks his messages uh, uh, on the phone and there's uh, one that says uh, hey Colin it's Bruce Coburn give me a call and it's like wow Maybe he wants to ask me for a guitar or something. And so, uh, would you like to tell us a little bit about this call from uh, your your perspective, your point, uh, your your side of the phone? Well, I'd known Colin for a really long time. Uh, I mean, since the mid '70s or early '70s, from the folk festival scene, and and uh, I knew he was a good player. And after we did the Stealing Fire album, uh, Stealing Fire, no. That's, yeah, no, I'm sorry. That, nothing but a burning light. Nothing but a burning light. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. We did that album, and I and I really I wanted. There, there's a, there's a lot of guitar on that record, and some of it you need two people to to do. And uh, so I I thought, yeah, you know, who can I get to be the other guitar player in my band? And I I thought, who who do I know that plays pretty close to how I do, and has a lot of the same musical background and interests and tastes. And, and Colin was the obvious one. So I just thought, yeah, I'll, I'll start with him and see what we can put together. And then Colin was excited. And But Colin's quite, uh, he can be quite persuasive. And uh, so, you know, I, I said, I don't know who else we're going to have in the band. But, but he said, oh, well, you know, we can use my band. <laughs> so, so we, I mean, basically, and I didn't want a keyboard player, but he persuaded me to, to get Richard Bell, which I'm glad we did. I mean, Richard was wonderful, but, but, uh, um, but I was imagining, you know, two guitars, bass and drums as, as the band. And, and I just thought Colin and I would play well together. And, and I think we did. Um, we had a lot of great times playing music together. So that was the beginning of it, it was just in terms of performing, but, when we got around to doing uh, Dart to the Heart, the next album, uh, I, Colin and Richard both ended up on that album um, because because they could <laughs> and because we were already connected then. And then after that, and Colin was in the studio with, with us and Thibaut and Burnett produced those, that, those two albums that we just spoke of. And then Colin uh, was really absorbing a lot from T-Bone about production. And um, it, that was obvious, uh, you know, and, and we, when it came time for me to do the next album, uh, which was the Charity of Night, I mean, not, not counting the Christmas album as sort of an aside, but, but the Charity of Night, um, 
I thought I, I, I wasn't going to do a T-bone again. That was understood. But, uh, and I wanted to sort of control how it went, but I didn't want to call myself the producer because I just don't feel like I know enough about production. I mean, I know what it, I know how to behave in a studio, but I, but I, I, I don't really know enough of the technology and, and, the, and the technical aspects of it. And Colin did. So I got Colin to be co-producer uh, with me. And after a while, I mean, we did a, another album like that. And then it was like, well, he's doing all the work. So we just started calling him the producer instead of co-producer. And he's been producing my albums ever since then. But, uh, you know, and we've gotten to play together every now and then, not, not as members of the same band, but uh, except in a casual sense. But, um, but it's been great whenever we have, so. But yeah, but going to going back to 1972, you you were behind the console of uh, my favorite David Whiffen's album, uh, Coast to Coast Fever. So yeah, because they they couldn't find anyone else, and and um, the yeah, I produced that album and I produced uh, inner, my own album, Inner City Front. But I didn't like the, my production on either of those records. I, I mean, <laughs> it's okay. It's just, it's okay. And it's not as, Inner City Front isn't as bad now when I listen to it as it seemed for a while. But uh, I'm mean, not that it was bad, but it just didn't, it, it lacked something that somebody who knew more about miking and all that sort of stuff could have got out of it. Um, and uh, the, the Whiffen album, It was a difficult album to do, but it but it created night vision too. Like that's that's the thing that that um, I had put together the band to do David's album with Dennis Pendrith and and John Savage on drums and Pat Godfrey, and we were, so we we all recorded Whiffen's album. But Whiffen uh, had to stop in the middle of that and and was away for a little while. So we were there. We'd been learning this music with this little band and. And, uh, you know, it's, and we didn't know when David was going to come back. So, okay, let's just, let's, let's learn my songs. And we learned a bunch of my songs and we went and recorded Night Vision. You could do that that quickly and easily in those days. It's much more of a complicated process now, it seems. But, um, but um, and eventually David got, came back around and, and we were able to finish his album. And, uh, I just felt like, I, I just didn't know enough to, I didn't, I didn't know enough about getting sounds on instruments. I didn't know, I didn't know enough about pushing people to, in certain directions, musically, et cetera. It, it came out okay. And I, I think David was happy with it. Um, nobody was happy with the lack of response that it got because the, the record company failed to promote it entirely. Uh, which was a sad thing, but, but, uh, but he was such a good singer. I mean, I, it, it's, uh, it, it was, it was a, a, an enjoyable experience to try to get those songs to, you know, uh, on record. I mean, that part of it was, was actually a good experience all around, but, but, uh, but uh, anyway, I was, I, a couple of times over the years, people have asked me to produce their albums, and it's no, no, I'm not the guy. Call Colin. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because because he, I mean, Colin knows it all inside out. Like what what limiter gets you what, to, you know, what kind of result and you know, which mics to put on which instruments and all that sort of stuff, and where to put them in the room. With things as a to me a kind of esoteric knowledge that. I, I just don't have the time and, and inclination to want to learn. Yeah, sure. It makes sense. And uh, yeah, let's conclude uh, this long journey and uh, talking about the important encounters, uh, the one with Colin Linden. There is another one and uh, going back also to the upcoming album uh, um, and the album that celebrate 50 years from your first recording is also a celebration uh, in my from my point of view as uh, in a way also 50 years since your first uh, uh, your first meeting with uh, Bernie Finkelstein uh, and mm -hmm. uh, so to keep past present and future together 
would you tell us a few things about your first meeting with him and what it means also to have him still by your side these days? I think the, the, the first meeting, <laughs> first time I met Bernie, I, we weren't working together. We, he was managing a band called The Poppers. Um, and, and I was in a band, an Ottawa band called The Children. And, and both The Poppers and The Children were opening acts for The Love and Spoonful in, at, a, at a, an arena in Toronto. And um, so I, you know, I met Bernie. Bernie was very brash and kind of pushy manager guy you know full of full of uh, full of enthusiasm for the, for the music but also you know kind of full of t wanting to make sure that his band was treated better than everybody else and and uh, <laughs> and at one point I think, I think Bill Hawkins who was uh, Hawkins was kind of a, a he was the Eminence Grise behind the children, uh, a poet who was a mentor to me in terms of writing and, and a, a couple of other things, but uh, who didn't really, he didn't perform with the band, but we, he came with us to Toronto because it was a pretty big gig. And, then, and he sat in a rocking chair on the side of the stage and read while, we, while the band played, like uh, on stage. But it, uh, as it, so he was kind of part of the band, but not. But he told Bernie to fuck off uh, on that occasion. <laughs> so, I, I don't know why. I don't remember the, what the context was there, but I, I do remember that. But but Bernie was part of the Yorkville scene, and so after I left, when I left Ottawa and went to Toronto, um, I I saw him on the street all the time in the Yorkville area, and he was around the clubs and the bands and. And all that, and then, then I got to be friends with Gene Martinek, who was a member of Kensington Market, and Bernie was managing that band at the time. And Gene produced my first ten albums, uh, and also um, I forget what one a later one also. I think the one after Inner City Front, um, the Trouble with Normal, maybe. But it, but um, but anyway the. He, Gene was also a great guitar player and, and you know, we, we sort of related to each other as, as guys playing in rock bands. Um, but, and I, I became acquainted with Bernie, didn't really know him. But when it was time to make my first album, when I felt it was time, I really felt like I wanted to record naively. I thought that if I recorded the songs that I had, I could forget them and, and make room in my head for new ones because I felt like I was getting choked up with all these songs. And uh, uh, Gene Martinek wanted to um, get into record production. And he and I were sitting having a coffee in a, in a cafe in Yorkville one day and talking about this. And, and I, I said, well, why don't, we, why don't we work out something here? If you want to be a producer and I want to make a record that doesn't have, you know, with nobody telling me I have to have strings on 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 it and stuff like that. I mean, I just want a simple record of my songs that sounds good. And uh, and he said, well, yeah. And he said, you know, Bernie wants to start a record company. So he went and got Bernie and he brought him down to me to 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 hear me at a gig I was doing. And and uh, and Bernie liked what he heard. And then we had a conversation. And when and Bernie found out that I wanted to make a really cheap album because I didn't want any extra stuff on it. It was perfect for him. And <laughs> it's like, okay, that's all right. True North is born, you know, and, and that's, that was it, literally the birth of True North records. And, uh, you know, a short time after that, after the album came out, we were getting a lot of calls. I didn't have a manager. Um, Bernie was getting a lot of calls from people about hiring me for gigs. And uh, he said, you're going to need a manager. And he volunteered himself. And so then I, at, by that time I'd, I knew him a little from doing the record and I thought, yeah, let's do it. So, and we've been doing it ever since basically on a handshake. We never have had a written contract, uh, you know, in the, in the 50 years, 52 now, you know, basically oh, yeah. we work together. So, so yeah. Yeah. That was a long journey. <laughs> it's a long history is the longest relationship of my life. Yeah. And so unusual for a musician to have a, such a long uh, history with, uh, with their own manager, with their own manager. It is, it is rare. 
I think the only other person I know uh, had a similar situation going was Neil Young. Uh, and, uh, but, but uh, yeah, it, it is unusual. Most people go through, they burn through managers or the managers burn through the artists. I mean, you know, it, things don't last that long. I mean, but uh, it just worked for me. It's a symbiotic kind of relationship that, that is, um, you know, I, I do the music, he does the business and, you know, but, and, and he, Bernie's like a careful listener and a really keen appreciator of, of, of the kind of music that I do uh, that, I mean, of pop music in general, I don't, I'm not sure how far his tastes go beyond that. We don't really talk about it much, but because I don't think he listens to a lot of classical music, for instance, but, but for folk and pop and stuff like that, I mean, he's, he's, uh, he, he's a hardcore fan and a deep listener and a thoughtful listener. So you can't, you know, not all managers bring that to the table. Yeah. He, uh, it combined with a savvy business sense that, that, like he has. So, you know, I'm, I'm grateful that he's been there and, you know, I guess we're sort of in this for life at this point <laughs> until one of us, until one of us blinks. <laughs> exactly. Well, and I'm grateful as well for this time together, Bruce. Uh, I, it was truly uh, an honor to have you here and to share all this, uh, this history and uh, all these things behind songs and life. So thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, it's been enjoyable talking with you. Thank you. Wondering where the lions are. 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 Well sung, thank you. <laughs>